Hi, I'm Connor. Thank you for um, inviting me to this amazing event. This is actually my first time in Tokyo, and I've wanted to come here ever since I was a little boy. So this is a great experience for me, and I hope that I'll be able to enlighten you guys this afternoon. So let's talk about biotechnology today. Biotechnology is an exceptionally important technology. That's where we get some of the world's most important technologies, including food, fuel, medicine, and materials. Um, when you combine these sectors, you realize that it equals about 2.5% of current US GDP, and it's expected to double to 5% uh, US GDP by 2020. And if you look at the numbers for Europe, uh, UK, uh, Asia, they're following similar trends. Um, so, so this kind of is an interesting uh, forecast because when you look at biotechnology products today, they typically cost billions of dollars and take a decade before they can come to market. So one of the questions that somebody might have is, well, where is this growth coming from uh, if the technology takes such huge resources to get going? Um, and the answer to that is uh, synthetic biology, of course. And to get into some of the, the uh, what synthetic biology is doing to biotechnology, I'm going to talk a little about what happened in another uh, tech boom, um, and that's in IT. And of course, we'll be speaking about Moore's Law. Um, and for those that don't know, Moore's Law is the idea that computing power doubles roughly every 18 months or so while maintaining the same price. So year over year over year, computing power grows exponentially. Um, and, and this has been an amazing thing for us. We've all experienced what's happened. Um, if any of you were lucky enough to use a computer in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, uh, chances were that it took up an entire floor of a building. Um, everyone you were working with had a PhD in computer science or at least a master's degree in computer science. And you're probably working at a bank uh, or a government or, or likely the military. Um, but you know, with Moore's Law in action for, for these decades, price and performance uh, w was getting much more competitive. And by the late 70s, we saw a, a radical paradigm shift in the advent of the personal computer. And I've got a, a photo there of the Apple I. And you'll notice that I show a picture of the computer from the 60s, and there's one of them. And I show a photo of the Apple I from the 70s, and there are many of them. And that's because you know, they cost just a few thousand dollars. They were accessible to a much larger audience. And so as a result, uh, we saw new types of people buying operating and programming these computers. We saw designers, artists, uh, parents, teenagers, uh, schools, students, all different kinds of groups started to get into the computer revolution because of uh, uh, the accessibility of the technology driven by, uh, by Moore's Law. Um, and as a result, you know, we had a whole new uh, um, group of people that were writing software. And they had a whole new set of problems that they wanted to solve. And of course, they were applying computer technology to solve these problems. So uh, I show in the photo there uh, an image of an early computer output from the 60s, which would be something like a, a military lookup table for uh, firing programs or for uh, uh, mapping data. And then, of course, today you realize that there are uh, hundreds, thousands, uh, dozens of thousands of software developers that are out there today that are creating applications uh, that are a little more frivolous by 60s, 1960s and 70s standards, but today um, we can't live without them. Uh, so of course Angry Birds is a huge uh, billion dollar franchise that is uh, software that's written that is, is not uh, uh, too difficult to implement. Um, and the good news is, so we're experiencing a, a similar, if not better, uh, disruption that's happening in biotechnology. And this is really being driven by uh, automation uh, in biotechnology. And so um, our capabilities today in uh, manipulating DNA uh, is, is breaking Moore's Law. It's beating Moore's Law. Our capabilities are getting uh, uh, growing faster than exponential in this case. And that's thanks to, again, automation in things like DNA sequencing, DNA synthesis, uh, and the proliferation of software. Um, and so I'll, I'll have a, a photo here that kind of shows where we are today uh, in biotechnology where you have large 
uh, corporations, uh, pharma, uh, agri, uh, oil, that spend millions of dollars on, on uh, biotechnology labs. And again, they're staffed by PhD level uh, researchers that take months and years and quite a bit of resources to, to bring one of their products to market. And this is changing now. Things are becoming automated. Things are getting into the hands of uh, uh, different groups of people, uh, again, thanks to um, technological advances. And you know, the question is then, OK, well, if today you know, we have our, our biological products, what are going to be the blockbuster biological products of tomorrow? And I think it would be a lot of fun to, to brainstorm on that for a few hours. But uh, you know, imagine uh, you know, in five years an Akihabara of, of biotech uh, popping up somewhere. And so let's take a step back and talk a little bit about what synthetic biology is. Um, so synthetic biology is the idea that DNA is software, that DNA is the code of life. Um, and with today's capabilities, uh, we have the, the power to read in DNA from an organism. So for example, we could take a sample from a red rose and get that DNA sequenced. When we have that DNA sequenced, at the end of that process, we have a digital file that exists on a computer. It's literally a text file that contains the DNA source code of that red rose. Once you have that DNA source code on your computer, uh, you can have a lot of fun with it. You can manipulate it using all the great computer tools that we have. Uh, you can drag and drop, cut and paste. You can email it. You can send uh, uh, biological code at the speed of light to the other side of the planet uh, for just pennies. Um, but what happens at this stage is people will actually do their genetic engineering inside the computer using tools. And of course, as it's virtualized, the cost plummets to the point where it's, it costs you almost nothing to uh, engineer DNA in a computer. I mean, you have to buy a computer, but everyone's got one already anyways. Um, but once you have uh, got that DNA in your computer, uh, let's say you have the, the red rose DNA and you take a piece of code from uh, a, a purple violet, and you insert the code for the purple violet, replacing the code for the red rose into the rose, and you think there, OK, well, maybe I've got a new type of rose that could be purple instead of red. But another step needs to happen. Uh, you actually need to get the real DNA manufactured. Um, and the technology is available already. It's called DNA synthesis. You can think about DNA synthesis as being very similar to a 3D printer, uh, but instead of it printing out a, a, a plastic uh, um, object, it prints out a real uh, double helix piece of DNA. Uh, and this, you know, you, you, you send your uh, file to this machine and it prints it out and then you've got it in your hand. After you have that, you then insert that into uh, a rose and, uh, and then grow it and see if your project worked. We're not at the point yet where we can say for certain at the design stage that this is going to work. There's still quite a bit of trial and error. But this process that I just explained uh, takes on the order of weeks and might cost you $1,000 uh, versus uh, a year and a million dollars and five or six PhDs uh, working to do this. Um, so the next question is, well, who's doing this? And we have a, a photograph here. Um, that's basically a picture of the globe. And each one of those points represents uh, one of the many thousands of users that use uh, the Symbiota platform, which is our suite of tools. And you can see that there are points on all seven continents. And this is really exciting for us because it really shows the interest in this technology that's coming from uh, just general people. Um, so we've been around for, for just about a year now, um, and the response has been really positive. And there's a, there's, uh, th this group sort of self-identifies as uh, do-it-yourself biology, or DIY bio. Um, and this group of people have been around uh, for five or six years now, and there are dozens and dozens of these self-identified groups of biohackers and biodevelopers and biotinkerers that have popped up in cities all around the globe. And there's one particular group that is a, has a quite an interesting story. Uh, they're called La Payasse, and they are from France. And um, uh, Thomas Landrain, who, who's pictured there coming up the stairs, he was a PhD student, and he got a knock on his door, and it was the police. 
and uh-oh, you know, he thought, what have I done? But he didn't do anything. The police were asking for his help. They said that they uh, found a, uh, an abandoned office in Paris, and it was filled with thousands of dollars worth of biotechnology lab equipment. And they wanted him to come and take a look to say, to, to comment on, did they just discover a, a derelict uh, a drug manufacturing den or, or, or bioterrorism or, or what's going on in here? And uh, so, we, so we got there and long story short, it turned out that it was actually a forgotten uh, uh, office um, that did environmental testing for Paris. So it turned out it was the government's office that they forgot about, but it was abandoned. Anyways, they said, what should we do with all this equipment? Uh, he said, well, tell you what, I'll, I'll take care of it for you. Don't worry about it. And so he jumped on that opportunity. He rented a cube truck uh, the next day, picked it all up, and drove it to a squat in the south of France underneath a derelict uh, old garage by the train tracks and put it in there um, uh, where, where he uh, grew a, a group of people that uh, included uh, software hackers, hardware hackers, and of course biohackers. Um, and they started working on projects uh, and they started to get noticed. And it got to the point where uh, the mayor's office of Paris realized that, hey, these guys are doing good work. We're looking to really promote the entrepreneurial community here in Paris. So let's actually give these guys a big grant, bring them down into downtown Paris, get them a real office, a real lab, where they've continued to work on amazing projects and are getting in Wired magazine and, and all these sort of things. Um, and so, so that's sort of like a great poster child example of what's coming up from this, this bottom-up uh, group of biohackers. But it's a really unique case. Not every uh, DIY bio group out there is so lucky that they can uh, get thousands of dollars worth of equipment uh, by luck. So what, what's left? What, what do the other groups do? Well, they do what they can. Uh, and the easiest thing to do is uh, get access to software and start building things uh, uh, at a software level. And so what you see here is uh, a software tool that we released um, uh, open source in uh, the spring of 2011, uh, where my co-founder and I, we were working at Mozilla at the time. And this is a, a, a web-based tool that allows people to engineer, edit, design pieces of DNA. Um, and it's, it's relatively straightforward to use. Um, but, but people were using that and it was fine and, and we continued to, to, to build these tools because we realized that uh, to do real bioengineering, it takes more than just editing a DNA text file. You actually have to, to make things happen in the real world. And so to that end, we partnered with another Canadian group called Genomicon uh, who are making what's called a, a wetware kit. So, uh, computers are referred to as hardware, computers run software, and in the biotech world, uh, uh, anything that is instantiated in the real world, uh, we, we like to call it wetware. It's a pretty cool term. Um, I don't know if, if professionals call it that, but that's what we call it, and we think it's pretty neat. But this is a, this is a kit here uh, that we make and sell that comes with real pieces of DNA that are configured in such a way that allow you to assemble them uh, in about an afternoon. And by assembling these pieces of DNA in different ways, you're able to create a custom uh, a DNA code that you can then put in a microorganism. In this case, it's E. coli, a lab strain of E. coli. And you can instruct that organism to uh, uh, produce various colors. So red, green, blue, yellow, glow in the dark, uh, all these things. Um, and this is sort of a, an educational tinker type of kit. Uh, but it's an example of where the technology can go. And uh, so in, in addition to that, we have also created um, uh, social tools that allow people to use the common uh, DNA development tool that we've provided, the common wetware platform that we've provided, and work independently, but then share their results, uh, which is uh, sort of bypassing what is typical in uh, the biotech world or life science world, where scientists will work in their individual labs on their own, uh, they'll do research for a number of years, uh, and even if they have a fantastic result, uh, they still put time and effort into writing a paper and trying to get that paper published. Once they get that paper published, then there you go, they've, they've had a success. And one thing that we're trying to do is get people's work actually out there so that other people can leverage it uh, uh, very quickly because we feel that the value uh, in what we're doing comes from creating the real product, uh, not, not only uh, creating a, an academic uh, journal paper. Um, 
And so finally, we have uh, uh, created another tool that's sort of like in early stages right now to, to support this, this network of performers that we have. And that is, uh, it's a bio app store. It's a marketplace where people that are using our tools to design new biological uh, solutions can then bring it to the app store uh, where other people can trust that it's coming from a good place and that it's a quality product and be able to s sell that or buy that and, and either use it or leverage that in their own research. So it's this sort of ecosystem that we're, we're really starting to create and, uh, and jumpstart. And so there's a, there's a case study that I can talk about. Uh, we, we initiated a, a program earlier this spring called Science Hack. Um, and Science Hack uses a custom wetware kit that we developed in partnership with Genomicon, which is called the Violacin Factory. Um, and Violacin is interesting because it's a, it's a research compound right now in, in the medical world. Uh, it has promising anti-cancer capabilities, promising antimicrobial capabilities. Um, uh, the issue is that it's only available from one supplier, and this supplier sells it uh, uh, for you know, $350 million per kilo. No, nobody buys it by the kilo. Uh, they buy it by milligram, but it is very expensive, and that means that it's, uh, it's very scarce. It's not in the hands of researchers, so research in this place, uh, in this space, goes very slowly. Um, so we thought that we would apply our technology to see if we could make this uh, interesting uh, uh, material abundant for, for an inexpensive price. Um, and so what we did was we created this kit and made it available for sale, and about 20 groups around the world have bought this kit and have started to build it, share uh, their results with other kit owners, and then those other kit owners then go back and tweak their research in an effort to create a, uh, a microorganism that produces the most amount of violacin uh, per unit of, of input food that these microbes eat. And uh, as a result of this, Forbes uh, earlier this year called this science hack project the most ambitious distributed science project. And uh, hopefully I'm, it'll live up to that. I, I'm pretty sure it will. Um, we have very compelling results that are coming out that we'll be publishing in the new year, uh, but so far so good. And so one thing that's interesting is uh, the, the, because this technology is so accessible, um, were, as, I, as we saw in computing, a lot more people from different backgrounds are getting involved. So this photo here is of the first cohort of people that participated in the Science Hack project and built a violation kit uh, uh, device. And so there's a, a group of about 20 people here. Three of them uh, have a formal training in biotechnology, life science. The remainder are made up of artists, designers, uh, computer hackers, uh, photographers, journalists. Um, it's quite a ragtag group of people, but each one of them were able to contribute uh, to this project. They weren't just uh, participating as, as spectators or bystanders. They were each uh, creating their own designs, building their own designs, and testing them. Um, and we actually saw that as a theme going forward with each uh, new uh, science hack that we did uh, it started to attract a lot more people. And, and to be honest, um, most of our fans come from design and architecture and computer science rather than coming from biotechnology, life science. Um, I, I, it's just a hard nut to crack with the life science people, but uh, hopefully they'll start to see a little bit of the writing on the wall. And uh, so the, the final question I have is like, who's, who's watching this? Who's taking notice of what's happening in this new space? And uh, one of the, the more exciting uh, opportunities to come out of this is that uh, um, venture capital firms um, like Y Combinator or IndieBio, which is a, a part of a group called SOS Ventures, uh, these are VC firms that have for years now um, invested uh, a startup capital in software companies, companies that are making apps, companies that are making uh, hardware, uh, but generally things that are related to the information technology realm where they feel comfortable in investing. Um, you know, because as I said before, biotechnology products uh, generally could cost a billion dollars and take a decade to come to market. But because we're starting to talk about biotechnology in, in a similar framework uh, as, as software development, uh, these groups that are comfortable in investing in software are starting to feel more comfortable investing in biotechnology. 
um, which is really exciting because we're starting to get not just uh, groups of ragtag people around the world who are tinkering and, and working on solutions that are interesting to them, but they're actually able to raise capital um, to make those projects a reality. So for example, this summer, uh, uh, there was a, the first cohort of synthetic biology um, uh, entrepreneurs came through a program called IndieBio, and uh, they accepted uh, six groups, and uh, four of those groups came from the Symbiota Network, and they completed their four months, and, and uh, they were able to come up with some, some products, and some of them were still in the research stage, uh, but that didn't stop them from receiving follow-on investment um, uh, close to almost $3 million between the three groups that got money. Um, so it's really exciting to see that kind of confidence and backing in, in such, a new, uh, such a new realm. Um, and finally, you know, we have uh, um, security and health and defense groups that are starting to take note because they uh, um, are interested to see the new types of capabilities that are available to, uh, to just anyone that has an interest. And, uh, I had a chance to meet with groups from the FBI and the Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security and all these, these groups, and it was frightening to meet with them because I've never really met with them uh, before, um, but it was exciting to find out that each and every one of those groups was just as excited about what's happening in a space as we are um, because they, they feel that there's a lot of opportunity going forwards. Um, and they, I think they've learned some lessons in the past where uh, they're, they're not trying to uh, stop technological development because it's not possible to do that. If they try and stifle it in the United States, it's going to grow somewhere else and that means the opportunity is going to go somewhere else. So they are taking uh, um, an approach of support. Um, and if they're offering support that's valuable, then people will come to them. Um, and, uh, and that's exactly what's happened. So in the summer of uh, 2012, uh, they held a international summit of uh, the DIY bio community in Walnut Creek, California. They invited the heads of all these different DIY bio groups. They paid for their flights and accommodations and flew them all to California uh, uh, where we were able to have, have some discussions. But what was really exciting about that is that they did the community a real favor because it was the first time that groups from America, Canada, Europe, and Asia were able to meet physically in person, shake hands, and talk about what we wanted to do. Um, and so it was an amazing experience. And uh, it's, it's just really exciting to see that everyone seems to be on board with this technology now. And uh, that's um, the end of my presentation. And hopefully I didn't speak too quickly. Thank you.